Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'd like to get started to make sure to leave our, our guests the uh, time for his presentation. Welcome to the uh, VTC Distinguished Public Lecture Series. Uh, it's my pleasure to be able to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Daryl Kirch, the President and CEO of the Association of American Medical Colleges, or AAMC or AMC, when you say the A's real fast together. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Kirch uh, <clears throat> did his training both as an undergraduate and his medical school training at the University of Colorado, uh, initially as an undergraduate in Boulder and then at the Medical Center in Denver. Uh, he stayed on there to do a residency in psychiatry and after that went to Bethesda to the National Institutes of Health where he worked at the National Institute of Mental Health for about a decade or so in a variety of positions there. Uh, he was a senior staff fellow in the neuropsychiatric branch uh, at NIMH. Uh, and then he also served as a director of clinical research, the scientific director, and then the interim director for a period of time uh, at the NIMH. Uh, from there, Dr. Kirch uh, went on to the Medical College of Georgia, uh, where he was uh, the dean of the medical school there, and also served as the dean of the graduate school <clears throat> at the medical school at that time. That's your double deaning position, by the way. <laughs> Uh, and from there, Dr. Kirch uh, <clears throat> loved being a dean so much, uh, he went on to uh, Hershey, uh, Pennsylvania, become the dean uh, and the senior vice president for health affairs of the School of Medicine at the Milton Hershey Medical Center at Penn State University. And just a little uh, less than a decade or so ago, uh, Dr. Kirch was tapped to take on the major leadership role at the nation's premier organization for representing academic medicine in the country, and that is the AAMC. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the AAMC, it represents uh, virtually, well, not virtually, all the medical centers and medical schools in the United States, uh, teaching hospitals, medical centers, uh, quite a lot of people through those organizations uh, that turn to the AAMC for leadership in a number of key areas. Uh, as a leader at the AAMC, Dr. Kirch has been involved with all kinds of important issues at the national level. He's been recognized by being elected as a member of the uh, Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Science. He's received the Distinguished Life Fellow Award of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, he also has received the NIMH Director's Award and a variety of other awards and serves in a number of capacities, including for the VA uh, and also for the American Council of Ed Education in a leadership capacity. Uh, in addition to being a well-known, respected, and influential leader, I do want to mention that Dr. Kirch is also not only a physician but a scientist as well. And he made a number of contributions during uh, the period of his life when he was more, had a little more time to be actively involved in research, uh, has had a keen interest and passion in understanding schizophrenia, uh, and was involved with a lot of very important studies over a number of years to try to understand uh, identification of biomarkers, metabolites, looking at the relationship of the nervous system, the brain, and other systems, the immune system, infectious disease, and so forth, to try to get a handle and a better biological understanding of this devastating disorder. And his work has contributed to the foundations of a lot of work that has gone on since then as well. In recent years at the AAMC, as I mentioned, he's taken a major leadership role and speaks as a, a, a broker of good faith that is highly respected in the uh, inside the beltway, as they say, on behalf of medicine and academic medicine uh, and health. <clears throat> and he has written on and spoken to issues of uh, healthcare delivery and the role of the academic medical centers. I would say he is the <coughs> most articulate, impactful, and eloquent voice on behalf of that in the United States, whether it's speaking to Congress or healthcare providers or the public on issues uh, addressing the physician workforce that we all know is a big challenge in this country as we go forward, medical education, the importance of medical research, and so forth. So he really is our voice, and uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Daryl Kirch. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Michael. I don't usually use this. I, I feel very... Uh, Academy Awards like. Uh, very. <laughs> so, I, I want to thank uh, Mike for a, a very generous introduction. I'm not sure I deserved it, but we have been friends for a long time, and I've been a great admirer of what Dr. Friedlander and Cinda, where did you, and, and Dr. Johnson and all their colleagues here have accomplished. Uh, I was talking with a group of students earlier today. And the innovation that's happening in medical education and research now, uh, the energy 
that you see on these new campuses like this one is, is just unmatched anywhere in the country, and it's really been wonderful to, to hear about your successes. So I knew this was a, a group uh, that ranged from perhaps some medical students, graduate students, faculty, to community uh, leaders. And so I was trying to think of, of a topic that might be of interest to the majority of you. So let me just take a quick straw poll. How many of you are currently or anticipate that at some point in the future might be a patient? <laughs> okay. Okay, now that we've cleared that up, I think I picked the right topic. Because by virtue of all being patients, where this country is headed around healthcare is uh, very, very important to each and every one of us. The uh, sad thing to me, as somebody who spent his career really uh, in healthcare and teaching medicine and studying science, is how politicized it's become. However, I think we may be at a point, because of things like what's happening here, that we are going to move from healthcare being a political football to perhaps a period of time when we're going to make some real breakthrough progress. And I'm going to make the case for this, okay, from uh, uh, a national perspective. Some things you know well, maybe some other data you don't know so well. And then I'm going to talk about why medical schools like this one, research institutes like this one, health systems like the one uh, next door are going to, in my mind, be central to driving us into this period of progress in healthcare, okay? So we do need to start off <clears throat> with our national political landscape. Uh, you can't ignore it. I did say the issue had been politicized. And so what I decided to do was to put on one slide a montage of people. And I'm going to ask you if you have the same warm, kind of collaborative feeling that I get when I look at where we started this year. <clears throat> now, I'm a highly trained uh, behavioral neuroscientists, these people do not like each other uh, that much. Even within the clusters, they don't, and we've seen that uh, very vividly in this primary season. I haven't been able to keep up even this week, so uh, I, I revised this slide on, uh, I think it was uh, Tuesday after the debate. <laughs> And I couldn't even keep up, uh, apparently, last night, doc, or, uh, Rick Santorum. I just gave him a doctorate. Uh, Rick Santorum dropped off. Um, I have been of the school of thought that the electoral process was what was broken, and that we weren't selecting statespersons, men and women, who would come to Washington or come to Richmond as a state capital and really get the work of the country done. And I was really uh, very surprised and also had a light bulb go on when one of my colleagues told me about some data that the Pew Foundation has gathered about us uh, over the last 20 years. Now this slide, you don't need to read the words, which are f small, unfortunately. But what this slide shows is the problem isn't necessarily the people we've been selecting, the problem is where we've gone as a, an entire nation. In 19, let me explain the way they do this. So Pew, starting in 94, they'd call you on the phone, and if you were willing to say, I'm a Democrat or a Republican, they'd say, are you willing to answer some questions? And what they would do then is, by virtue of your answers, they could put you on the spectrum from, oops, sorry, from being very consistently conservative to consistently liberal. But 20 years ago, remember uh, Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich? They actually, even though they were on opposite sides of the fence, they were still getting things done in Congress. Because as an electorate, we were pretty close to each other. There wasn't a lot dividing us. 
Even 10 years after that, in 2004, we were still fairly close with a lot of overlap. And then 10 years later, look what happened. 90% of Republicans are to the right of the median Democrat. 90% of Democrats are to the left of the median Republican. <clears throat> I'm not endorsing anybody here, but if you are surprised by the strength of a Bernie Sanders or a Ted Cruz, just look at this. Now, I have a theory. I'd love to hear your theories when we, we have the discussion. My theory about the cause of this is cable television and talk radio. <laughs> I think you are now able, as an American, to listen to only one set of facts, and many of them are not even facts. <laughs> but you get selectively the, the, the information that comes from your part of the bubble, <clears throat> and it drives us increasingly out to extremes. And I, I, this is, happens on both sides. You know, whether you, you listen to uh, uh, Bill O'Reilly or Rush Limbaugh, or you listen to Rachel Maddow or Al Sharpton, you're, you're kind of pushed to the ends. Why am I bringing this up? It's because this has had a profound effect in healthcare. It obviously played out in the passage of the ACA, which we'll return to in a moment, in which it was a purely party line vote. They couldn't come to some agreement of a bipartisan bill. But now you're seeing it play out, including in Richmond, even as we speak, in a key health care issue, which is, are you as a state going to accept the federal dollars that are available to give Medicaid to more low-income people? So the ACA created a program that made the, it possible to do that. And initially, right after the ACA was passed, you would only find orange states that had accepted Medicaid where there was also uh, democratic control of the legislature and the House, and in the Republican states, they did not. Um, now, the map is changing. Uh, conservative states, Arizona, Montana, North Dakota, Arkansas, Louisiana, have expanded uh, Medicaid despite the fact that it's an ACA program and Republicans who control uh, government in those states are, are opposed to it. Why is it expanding? I think it's because when you cut through the political partisan noise, some facts are hard to dispute. Um, the facts are that if you have health insurance, you lead a longer, healthier life. So my association supported the ACA, but we're nonpartisan. We supported it because as physicians and scientists, we knew that insuring more Americans would generally improve the health outcomes in the nation. So let's now dive a little more into health in America and where we stand with that. Well, here are the facts of the ACA. Let's call this the science the data of the ACA as opposed to the politics, the reality is that there are 16 million more Americans who have health insurance. I'm the first to say that many of those insurance policies are not that great and could be improved, but it's better than having no insurance of any kind. We're down to now, actually it's closer to 10% of Americans who are uninsured, the lowest rate we've ever seen in the history of America. Uh, I can speak of uh, uh, the benefits, for example, of the elimination of pre-existing conditions. There are many people who've had chronic illnesses that were cut out from insurance. I'm saying all these things, again, not as a political case, but as a scientist just trying to look at the evidence and the facts. Uh, this being said, <clears throat> there are still way too many people out in the uninsured cold. Depending on you count, count, how you count it, probably anywhere from 30 to 35 million Americans. 
And if you and I left here and met again on Saturday night in the emergency room at Carillion, we would see many of those people. It doesn't have to be Saturday night. It can be any hour of the week. We would see many of those people who are there in the emergency room because they didn't have the health insurance to get ongoing care for their, their chronic problems. These are facts we have to, to uh, confront. It's creating an interesting trend. If you go back to 2010 and look at the blue line and people were asked what their biggest obstacle was to uh, obtaining access to health care, uh, it was mainly their inability to pay for it. It was their lack of insurance. Now, look at how the blue line has been dropping as people have gotten insurance, but which line is coming up? Can't find a doctor. Uh, I, I know a few doctors. <laughs> it took me almost 12 months to locate a primary care physician when I moved to Washington to take my current position. And you hear stories like this all the time. I get calls from friends, family members all over the country. Can you help me find a doctor who will see me? Uh, those lines are about to cross now, where the problem is less the financial obstacle. And here's what's really scary about this. This says that one of our biggest health challenges <clears throat> is access to physicians, and yet when we measure how many physicians America has and is likely to need, we come up within our most recent analysis evidence that America will be short 46,000 to as high as 90,000 physicians by uh, 2025. I don't know what you plan to be doing in 2025, but you'd probably like to be able to see a doctor when you need one. Now, why is this happening? It's happening, again, for one reason that is political. You, you would have no reason to know this, many of you, but there's been a cap on the federal funding for residency training for physicians. So yes, you have to get an MD to become a doctor, but you really need to then train in a residency to go out and practice. And there's been an artificial cap that was placed on the number of residencies by Congress back in the late 90s that hasn't been lifted. But the real reason that this is happening, that this shortage is looming, is me and my fellow members of the silver tsunami, the baby boom. There are 10,000 Americans, boomers, turning 65 every day. And if they're like me, they're going to want to ski until they're 90, even if every joint has to be titanium. <laughs> If they're like me, they have some, fortunately in my case, relatively uh, minor, but they're chronic medical problems. I know I'll probably acquire more. So we have a need certainly on the primary care side, and one of the emphases of this school is certainly to identify physicians interested in doing that, but we also are going to have needs. Think about uh, an aging population, orthopedics oncology, cardiology, rheumatology, you can go down a, a long list. So, we got the insurance moving in the right direction, but it seems like the doctor supply is moving in the wrong direction. Despite your best efforts, you've expanded the supply of MDs by creating the school here, but it's that residency obstacle. And then we get down to the toughest part about all this. I, uh, I, was, I was mentioning uh, in an earlier discussion today that in, uh, a couple years ago I had a chance to meet with the deans of the medical schools in Taiwan and then m went to South Korea to meet with the med schools in South Korea. And it was fascinating to me how <clears throat> quickly in both cases they found a way to weave into the conversation the fact that their health outcomes were better in their country than ours. And they were right about it. When you compare the United States to other developed nations, 
Uh, the only place where we're number one is not where you want to be number one. It's obesity. And then things like infant mortality. You know, how can the, the wealthiest nation ever seen on this planet have the fourth highest infant mortality of, of any country? We have outcomes that are nothing to be proud about. Now, Virginia, interestingly, as a state, despite some of the challenges in more rural areas of Virginia, uh, Virginia actually looks very much like the U.S. picture, but as my grandmother would say, that's nothing to write home about, right? If we're just matching the overall poor outcomes that the U.S. has as a nation. We have this situation of these poor outcomes uh, despite the fact that we spend more than anybody else. So this is our per capita healthcare uh, spending, or no, I'm sorry, this is our percent of gross domestic product. So this is the percent of our annual wealth that gets spent on healthcare, and you see us up there being twice as high as Great Britain, uh, Hungary, Korea, Czechoslovakia, many other European and Asian developed countries. Now here's where this gets interesting, and again, this is something we might want to talk about. You might say, how can this happen? How can the country that spends so much, that has such great science, such great pharmaceuticals being developed, that really we're the, the inventors of the best in healthcare, how can we have such poor outcomes? There's a graph, many of you, I'm sure, have seen this graph in one form or another, but there's another factor that you probably haven't seen graphed, and that's if you take these same nations, these same developed nations, and you look at what percent of GDP gets spent on things like public health programs, preventive programs, education, healthy neighborhoods, good transportation systems, air quality, keeping the lead out of the water in Flint, Michigan. When you look at those factors, look at how we rank. So what we're actually doing is shortchanging the social environmental factors that contribute to health, and then we're paying the price on the tail end by spending a lot of money on a managing acute and chronic illness because of the ground that's lost. <clears throat> okay. What does this mean for our future? Now, uh, as, as Mike mentioned, I, am, I did train in psychiatry, um, but I've never gathered 100 people together and intentionally depressed them. <clears throat> That's against my Hippocratic oath. The reason I've outlined these facts is that I feel um, for us to make progress, breakthrough progress in healthcare, we've just got to be honest with ourselves. We've, we've just got to acknowledge where we're good, and there is so much good in our science and our medicine, but where we fall short, which is really a system that isn't working well and a system that doesn't have strength on the social support side around things like education, public health, preventive care. <clears throat> but I'm an optimist because there's so much intellectual capital in this country. We have so much wealth. We have so much creativity, so much drive. I believe we can move forward. And so for the second half of this, and then we'll have lots of time to talk, I'm going to, to talk briefly about the progress we're going to make and what I think are some key success factors to get there. So, there's a term that's used a lot when people talk about where we want to get in healthcare, and it's called the triple aim. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with it. And the notion is we not only want a system where somebody like me, somebody who has good health insurance, somebody who knows lots of doctors can get good care, but we want a system where everybody in our community can get good care, and we want to be able to afford it to not bankrupt our kids and our grandkids running up debts in, in Medicaid and, and other things. That's this pretty simple triple aim. 
but it is a complex process to try and get there because it has a whole set of parts. It means rethinking the way we pay for health care, and I'm going to come that, back to that in a few minutes. It means rethinking the model of health care. You know, it is not a good model for health care to let somebody get really sick, no preventive care, no primary care, and then have them show up in an ER. That is not the best care model. So we have to redesign that. And then we need to fix the workforce, not just that physician shortage uh, that I mentioned, but it's how people work together. The next two you may not like as much because they, they are going to be tougher and some of them are about, about us. One is that we have to think about our attitudes. I was in a meeting once several years ago and a gentleman who was an executive at Johnson & Johnson was in the room with uh, some physicians. And somehow the, the question turned to what, do, what is the attitude of Americans about health care? What do Americans want from health care? And the, the, Dr. Gorey said, oh, it's really simple. Americans only expect a few things. They want the very best treatment known to man. They want it immediately. They want somebody else to pay the bill. And if anything goes wrong, they want to sue somebody. <laughs> and you know what? There's, I think, some truth about that. I think we've had an insatiable appetite in America, sometimes for the high-end things, the pill, you know, ask your doctor about <laughs> the pill that just looks like it will cure all your ills, those kinds of things. And we don't think so much about are our expectations real. And we've got to change our culture. This is a big one that I want to return to in, uh, in just a moment. So to get to the triple aim, we're going to have to pay attention to all of these. What I want to finish with is why I think the places that are going to solve it are places like Virginia Tech, Carillion, the Research Institute, because of the, the active ingredients, the secret sauce, the magic that can actually accomplish uh, progress in these things. We do public opinion surveys. I know many of you are from the community, and we actually go to several cities around the U.S. every few years, and we convene a group of you, and we actually probe your attitudes. What do you think? about medical schools and teaching hospitals. We just completed another round, <coughs> pardon me, and these are what general people out in the public look to medical schools for. They, um, and I think they, they are highly valued by the public and we deliver that. I don't think the public though sees us as redesigning healthcare and I also don't think the public knows how indispensable teaching hospitals, medical schools really are. Here's an infographic that I take every time I meet with a senator or congressman and I'm trying to explain to them the special place that medical schools and teaching hospitals have. So uh, you have a great teaching hospital here, Carillion. Uh, it is one of America's uh, uh, academic health centers, but there are almost 6,000 hospitals in this country. Only 5% of them are teaching hospitals. But look at those numbers. They take care of nearly a quarter of all the hospital care. The 5% of hospitals, almost a quarter of all the clinical care. Almost 40% of all the care for those uninsured patients. And then when, when it really gets bad in life, just uh, as we were driving in from the airport, I could see the trauma center helicopter landing on the rooftop across the street. When you need a trauma center, a neonatal intensive care unit, burn units, pediatric ICUs, when you need an Ebola, treatment center, cancer centers, all those things are concentrated in these teaching hospitals. So the public values, the teaching of doctors, the science and all, 
What I don't think the public understands is how central, how critical we are to the existence of this nation. Uh, you, you know, the tragedy of the Boston Marathon bombing was awful. But what a lot of people don't realize is it was truly remarkable that in the marathon bombing, anyone who made it to a hospital survived. And that was because they were, the bombing, that awful event, was right in the middle of some of the country's greatest teaching hospitals. Massachusetts General Hospital, the I. Deaconess, Brigham and Women's. So, what do the academic health centers, what do places like this one need to do? Well, we are, and I would argue your, your people working here on curriculum, people working in the health system are trying to change our culture. Remember I mentioned on those moving parts that need to change the issue of culture? Uh, what is culture? Uh, I, the best, one of the best descriptions I ever heard is uh, it's all around us. It's like the air we breathe. And just like the air we breathe, we don't think about it that much. But every organization, every nation, every system has a health care, has a culture, rather. And in health care, our culture uh, is not paid enough attention to. Everybody develops a strategic plan. I have new deans who were just appointed. I'm sure Cinda's had this experience. And they always call up and they say, I need to have a strategic plan. Give me the name of a consultant. And my first question is always, well, why don't you work on your culture and understanding your culture at first? But no, no, they want to have the plan. But culture does trump strategy. A certain kind of culture will determine whether any strategic move you make works or doesn't. Well, what's the culture problem in healthcare? It's that the healthcare world I grew up in, the medical education world, to be honest about it, was very much on the left-hand side. It was hierarchical, right down to at what point your white coat could get longer. Um, you know the, the game Paper Covers Rock? You know, assistant professors cover, or, uh, cover instructors, associate professors. Everything was hierarchical. It was all autonomous in many ways. It was, you're not the boss of me. I have a doctorate. It was very expert-centric and competitive, very individualistic. That has been, and that culture, I don't want to fault it. It served us well in many ways, historically. But what we need today is a culture that's on the right. So if you, I don't know if you've been a patient, especially if you've been a patient seriously ill. It doesn't matter to you if you have a lot of experts involved in your care if they don't talk to each other, if you don't know who's accountable for you, if you don't know who to talk to. When you think about what a patient needs, and that's when you just can see that the culture of healthcare needs to be centered on the patient, not on me as the expert in XYZ. You need to be able to know who's accountable. There needs to be a sense of collaboration and teamness, something that we'll return to. So one critical success factor for us to really get healthcare where it needs to be is, is going to be culture change. Tied to that, I think a critical factor is who we bring in to healthcare. I think to have the right kind of culture. So if, if I'm saying that in healthcare we need to be more team-based, doesn't that mean that when we select people to come into healthcare, or for that matter, biomedical research, one of the things we should probe for is what, what can you demonstrate to me that shows that you know how to work and perform in a team, as opposed to just as an individual? You know, I think, and, and, and I have to be really honest with you, uh, in many ways, over history, the AMC contributed to this problem. If you go talk to medical students, pre-med students now, um, and ask them what the most important thing coming up in their life is, 
most of them will answer with one phrase, the MCAT. <laughs> now the AMC uh, operates, owns and operates the MCAT examination. But I'm going to be the first to tell you that it only gives you a slice, a narrow view of what a person is bringing to medicine. So how many of you, okay, let's be honest here, who in this room has asked their physician what their MCAT score was? <laughs> you assume a certain level of academic readiness, but what you're really concerned about are these other dimensions. Does this person understand my particular culture, background? Do they appreciate that people are different and diverse? And especially what a phrase that we're using now is what's their pre-professional readiness? What's their frustration tolerance? What's their empathy? You know, the foundational things that you expect from a doctor. We did a sur one of our public opinion surveys a couple years ago asked uh, general members of the public, how confident are you in the medical knowledge of medical school graduates? And it was 95% were highly confident and confident. And then the next question was, how confident are you in the bedside manner of medical school graduates? It was in the low 60s. So what was clear is that historically we had emphasized academic readiness because it was easy to test at the expense of these other factors. Places like this school have really been leading the way uh, in trying to broaden this perspective. From our perspective as, the, as an association, we've actually even tried to make the test better. Remember that point we discussed earlier about the social factors that determine health outcomes? Well, the MCAT exam never even asked about social or behavioral sciences. Did a great job of looking at things like biochemistry, but it didn't go there. Now the new MCAT, which just started this year, last year rather, has this whole section on the bio, uh, the behavioral rather, and social foundations of health. It has a section on critical reasoning this school, I believe, Cinda, correct me if I'm wrong, uses the MMI technique uh, for interviewing applicants to medical school. Uh, one of the things we're working on now, we talked about with the students some earlier, is why not, why couldn't the AMC, given where web-based technology is, why couldn't we sort of do a first pass interview of every applicant to medical school in a web-based interview? and then have that evaluated and provide that admission to uh, information to admissions committees before they, uh, they even came. We could do this on the residency level too. Now we were having an interesting discussion with the students. Not every specialty is the same. You know, if we did a web-based interview, maybe for the radiologist we would say, um, how much do you like dark rooms? <laughs> Um, maybe for the psychiatrist, we just say, what do you think about that? <laughs> or what's your earliest childhood memory? I don't mean to be facetious. What, I, what I'm really driving at is I think we can have a much broader perspective of who we want to bring to medicine. I am saddened by the number of really bright, empathic, service-oriented people who tell me they didn't think of medical school because they thought you had to love organic chemistry. I hated organic chemistry, <laughs> uh, but I don't think it held me back uh, as a physician. Also, uh, we have to work on the pipeline. Remember, diversity was part of this. Mike, I believe that's you. I'm not sure what you're doing in that, uh, <laughs> or demonstrating. But you've done a wonderful job here um, uh, with the program you have, uh, summer camp, I believe it is, a science summer camp program with middle schoolers. You have other outreach programs. Uh, I think you did a mini med school uh, here for the community. Uh, that kind of reaching out to people so that they see healthcare and medicine as a broad tent that can include a lot of people, not just a small segment of academically gifted people. 
So we talked about culture. We talked about the kind of people we want to bring into this culture. And then we are changing the way we educate them. <clears throat> and I see that at, at work here, too. If you think about it, you know, in an ideal world, right, somebody would be born over here, they would uh, uh, leave the womb, realize they want to be a doctor, <laughs> You know, they'd ask the obstetrician who delivered them for a letter of recommendation. <laughs> and, and then they would move through a sequence of steps to becoming a master physician, but they would always have in mind here what a good doctor at the bedside would be. Medical, that would be the ideal model of medical education. What medical education, unfortunately, uh, I think over the decades, focused on at the expense of that picture of the good doctor at the end was facts. So um, if you talk to pre-med students, I had uh, daughters, uh, neither of whom wanted to go into medicine, but both of whom figured out that they could become very popular among the pre-meds on their campus if they said their father was president of the AMC. <laughs> and, I, you know, I don't know what their friends believe, that I would give them the secret code to the MCAT exam or something. But when I talk with those students, they say, they say Dad, so-and-so uh, is really interested in medicine. Could you talk to them? They were so focused on this single test here that it was really a struggle to get them to think about what is your idea of what a career in medicine requires, of what the challenges and gratifications are. And I think unfortunately, again, because testing for facts is fairly easy, we've had this strong, strong emphasis. I'm not saying doctors don't need to know things, but I'm saying the emphasis has been very, very strong on this line. I had a medical school roommate and on the morning of a test, I'd come down to the kitchen table and I'd try to say good morning. And he'd say, don't talk to me. I'm full of facts. <laughs> and we all felt that way, as if we would load the facts, take the exam, delete the facts, accumulate a new set of facts, and just move. This is the paradigm shift, though, that I think is occurring and that all the people here who've worked on the curriculum are really trying to take into account. And the reason the shift has to happen is because of this. When I was a medical student, okay, this is a little complicated, but this is, this is the number of facts. Just pretend these are arbitrary numbers here. This is the number of facts a human brain can hold. Okay, I have bad news for you, it's not getting any better. <laughs> and for me personally, it's dipping down. <laughs> Human cognitive capacity is limited, and Bill Stead, who's a physician at Vanderbilt, has, has illustrated this. But he said our problem was, for a long time, we pretended as if a single brain could accumulate enough facts to make all the good clinical decisions. So I don't know if there are any physicians in the audience who trained in the era I did, but you would never, when you were on rounds in the hospital, you would never look something up. That was a sign of deficit, of weakness. We pretended that, that if you were going to be a really good student, you, you had enough facts in your head. Well, what we did is we snuck into the back room and looked them up, but we bought into that. Bill Stead's point is that with the incredible science going on, the kinds of genomic science, now proteomics, metabolomics, that you see here, the number of facts that are relevant to the decision about your health are here. Now, there still are facts that are foundational and important. You know, basic principles of drug interaction, drug toxicity, uh, uh, issues of drug addiction around basic concepts are critical. But now, if I need to know the, the half-life of a specific drug, I take out my iPhone. There is an app for that and just about everything else. So it's changing our focus in learning from facts to more focus on competencies. 
And without going into great detail, there actually are some structures, domains of competencies around which there's pretty remarkable global agreement. And notice that one of them is medical knowledge, the facts, the foundational facts. But isn't it just as important to you that one of them be interpersonal and communication skills? That, that bedside manner domain. Isn't it important that people do know how to work as part of a healthcare team, uh, not just with other physicians, but with nurses, pharmacists, and others? Don't you want to feel that there are core competencies in professional ethical behavior, and so on? So more and more, the education is shifting, not to completely away from facts, but building the foundation and then assessing the development of competencies from somebody being a novice to being a master physician. Just like uh, there's innovation in <clears throat> education, there is enormous innovation in research, and I think many of the lectures in this series have focused on some of the really incredible uh, advances that are occurring in research both here and elsewhere. I guess the point I would make about our shift in perspective there is when I, when I was at NIH, as was mentioned for many years, the focus really was on first and foremost the bench research. And that has yielded tremendous advantages. And we also did clinical studies. Those were important. But now we're gaining an appreciation for the kinds of research that are, they're called different things, but they exist down in this part of the spectrum. Francis Collins, who actually came to NIH when I was there, and I had the pleasure of knowing him when he started the Genome Project, so here's a man who is a legend in the field of genomics. Francis Collins now says one of the things we need is better science of healthcare delivery. So it's not just knowing what the mechanisms are of asthma, but it's having a science that can tell Carillion how do we keep asthmatics from needing to go to the emergency room? What are the things we can build into our system? So this is the innovation now that is being driven in science. And it's uh, matched by innovations in clinical care. Uh, we mentioned how we have had our focus so much on hospital-based uh, acute care, rescuing people. You know, but if you have congestive heart failure, rather than coming into the hospital and being admitted five times during a year because you're in, in heart failure, isn't it better if the system is redesigned so that by taking weights and monitoring perhaps other simple factors like blood pressure and being checked perhaps by uh, somebody on home health or, or telephonically with your primary care physician, you can be managed maybe with consultation with a clinical pharmacist, and not even end up having to go to see the cardiologist, the heart failure specialist, and be admitted. People say that redesigning healthcare is like, going, like, like trying to redesign an airliner in flight. It is complicated. And, and now what I think, I'm, the point I'm making, is that we're not only in places like this redesigning healthcare, we're redesigning education and redesigning research the, to have a fuller spectrum. So um, what's the name of the, the, the uh, Air Force group, the Blue Angels? So this is like redesigning the Blue Angels in flight multiple aircraft flying in formation, but it can be done, and I could, you know, see real progress on every campus I visit, including this one. You've embraced the challenge, and it's, it's a wonderful thing for this community, and it'll be a wonderful thing for the nation as the 5% of hospitals that are teaching hospitals partnered with research institutes and schools get us where we need to go. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that 
we really do have to master the teams thing. One of the things that depresses me is how much energy gets spent in a state capital like Richmond, or I happen to live in Maryland, they go to Annapolis, and you see nurses and doctors and optometr optometrists and psychologists fighting over scope of practice and who can do what independently, when what we need more than anything is interdependence. And the AMC has worked very hard on this issue. Teams are a hard thing to build. If I ask the people in this room, how many of you are not a team player? We all believe we're a team player, but teams don't happen by spontaneous combustion. Uh, what we have in medical schools and hospitals, unfortunately, aren't usually teams. They're called committees. <laughs> we tend to bludgeon ourselves with committees. A true team, as Katzenbach and Smith in their book and subsequent articles outline, is a very different animal with very different dynamics, very different shared accountability, much higher levels of trust and honesty. We've been focusing very much on our work with nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, public health, the osteopathic schools, in trying to push forward on these principles of collaborative so where I'll finish is that there's one thing that I will fight to have not change, and that is the ethical foundation of medicine. You know, I, I probably stand up here and I sound, sound like somebody who's deeply embedded in politics and policy and organizational change, but what I'm really most anchored by uh, are the ethics of not just medicine, but every health profession. The beauty of ethics in clinical care is you only have four principles and they tell it all. They are do good, beneficence, do no harm, non-maleficence, respect the autonomy of the patient, and try to create a just system for all patients. Whatever the textbook of medical clinical ethics you read, in one way or another, they tend to reduce to those four principles. These were the principles that were captured by Sir Luke Files in this painting from the late 1800s. Uh, uh, he had, in fact, lost a child to an acute infectious illness. Uh, this painting hangs in the Tate Gallery in London. It's called simply The Doctor. Our task today is to maintain the same kind of focus, concern, uh, objectivity combined with empathy that you see in this interaction, uh, not ignoring necessarily the, the father and mother here, but committed to doing the best for the child. How we do that, and I believe we can, when the doctor has an iPad in his or her lap, uh, the next room has a MRI scanner, uh, there's a team of other health professionals around. This is what will be the trick. How do we preserve the dynamics of the interaction, the commitment to the ethics, while taking advantage of all that technology and all that science. I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be in the job I have if I didn't believe we can do this as a country. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you for inviting me to Roanoke. Thank you very much, Daryl, for that <coughs> inspiring and provocative talk. Uh, we have some time for questions and comments. Floor is open. And I, it's always interesting for me to know who people are and what they do. Uh, so unless you are in a witness protection program. <laughs> so Carissa, and, why don't you stand up? And if you could stand up and project. Who you are. So we can all hear.